welcome to the webinar by the European Association of Cardiovascular Imaging on the topic, Diastolic Function Made Easy, Tips and Tricks for Daily Practice. My name is Otto Smith, working in Oslo. Heart failure with uh, preserved ejection fraction is increasingly common and now makes up more than 50% of all heart failure cases. The focus of this webinar is on how to recognize the condition and how to make a diagnosis by echocardiography. And with me today, I have two of the international leaders in the field, Professor Jay O from the Mayo Clinic, also working in Seoul at the Samsung Heart Vascular and Stroke Institute, and Professor Bogdan Popescu, who is the immediate past president of the European Association of Cardiovascular Imaging, and working in Bucharest at the Institute of Cardiovascular Diseases. And the first presentation is by Professor Popesco, please. Thank you very much. Good day to everyone. A pleasure to be here. I have no disclosures related to this presentation. So there are two main questions one needs to answer when assessing diastolic function. First of all, whether diastolic dysfunction is present or not, and then whether LV filling pressure is elevated. To answer these questions, one should always start by first looking for the relevant clinical information, that is, risk factors or comorbidities related to heart failure with preserved ejection fraction mainly. So complete clinical data should be obtained first and considered in deciding on the presence or absence of cardiovascular disease. For example, the presence of hypertension, diabetes, coronary artery disease, history of myocardial infarction, or chronic kidney disease. Moving after the clinical data to the echo data, one should remember that uh, structural changes are more robust and stable uh, than hemodynamic Doppler parameters. So, uh, for example, structure changes such as pathologic LV hypertrophy or dilated left atrium are features suggestive of diastolic dysfunction, and uh, this is particularly true when alternative explanations have been excluded. Once these uh, information is acquired, we can then move to Doppler uh, parameters. And in fact, the current recommendations make the point that we can start by measuring four key or principal parameters related to various pathophysiological aspects of diastole. Uh, so we talk about E prime as a measure of myocardial relaxation that is crucial for the presence of diastole dysfunction. Um, left atrial volume index is a parameter of structural changes that I've just mentioned. The ratio of E over E prime as a measure of filling pressures and TR velocity as a measure of primary pressure. So we measure four main parameters. We have a cutoff value for each of them and then we judge whether these are normal or abnormal values. And then we employ a sort of reasoning like uh, whether if uh, the patient has uh, less than half of these parameters positive, then the, the diastolic function is assessed to be normal. If one has more than half positive, uh, the patient has diastolic dysfunction, and if it's 50-50, then diastolic function is indeterminate. So this algorithm works in patients with normal ES. Then this is the second algorithm. Once diastolic dysfunction has been diagnosed, uh, in patients who have reduced ejection fraction and in patients who have normal ejection fraction but evidence of myocardial disease after considering the clinical and the structural 2D data, one goes on to assess the level of filling pressure and to grade the diastolic dysfunction. And here one starts from the mitral inflow and if you have a low E over A ratio, then the pressures are presumed to be normal. Left atrial pressure is normal. If you have a E over A, which is high, above 2, 
then left atrial pressure are presumed to be increased. And again, in the middle, we have to employ several parameters, which are three of the ones that I've already mentioned, and apply the same sort of reasoning. The more abnormal you have, the higher the likelihood that the filling pressure is elevated. And what I'd like to, to show you a case. This is a case of a 49-year-old man who has coronary artery disease, single vessel disease, and several risk factors like hypertension, impaired fasting, glucose, dyslipidemia, and he's also overweight. You can see here the four chamber views of this patient. The patient had left ventricular hypertrophy with, a, with an estimated LV mass of 135 grams per square meter. He also has left atrial dilation, 40 uh, milliliters per square meter. You can see that the ejection fraction is normal. There are no wall motion abnormalities and no significant mitral regurgitation in this patient. So we started by looking at structural data. Now moving to the Doppler data, you can see the mitral inflow uh, E over A is 1.1. The E over E prime is 12 using the average E prime. As I've said, left atrial volume index is 40. But in this particular case, the TR jet was not measurable. So TR velocity was actually not available. So I would like to start uh, by asking you a question about this case related to the filling pressure <clears throat> in this patient. What do you think about the level of filling pressure in this case? One, normal. Two, increase. And three, cannot determine. And you have 30 seconds to answer this question. Think about the data that I've showed you. And then once we have the answers, we can briefly comment and argue about the correct answer. And then I'll show you what we did further with this. Uh, the response was that uh, normal was uh, assumed to be the case from 26%, increased filling pressure by 29%, and they cannot determine by 43%. Okay. And maybe comment right away, Professor Pesco. Yes, indeed. So if you go by the algorithm, we are in the middle of this diagram because E over A was between 0.8 and 2 here. So then you have to employ three criteria, which we did, but only two were available and one was positive, left atrial volume index, the other was negative. The over E prime didn't make the, the, the threshold. So actually in this situation, the algorithm tells us that we cannot really determine the level of, of uh, the left atrial pressure, the level of filling pressure. So just one word, because I think that's an important practical problem, and uh, it's important because if you just have four parameters that you recommend, and out of these, one is not available, then uh, things become more complicated. And the question is, how feasible is measuring TR velocity in a large sample? I've just selected two of the more recent publications. One is from the EACVI, the Euro Filling Study, and uh, the other one is from Balaine. Both were published in the last couple of years, and both were trying to uh, assess the uh, accuracy of the proposed algorithm. But I will just point out that TR jet was measurable in only 40% of the European study, in only 60% of the American study. And in fact, measuring TR velocity is a frequent problem, especially in patients with normal ejection fraction. The guidelines recommend us to use contrast echo in the form of agitated cell line in order to increase the feasibility of TR velocity recordings. However, I doubt that many labs do this uh, measurement uh, routinely because it's a bit cumbersome and you need uh, the IV line and you need to uh, inject the line and so on and so forth. So this is something to remember. What did we do in this case? Well, we have recorded uh, the palmary vein flow and here you can see the right upper palmary vein from the four chamber view with color Doppler. This was sampled and you can see here the pulse wave spectrum, you see that S is larger than the P wave. The AR wave is clearly recorded, 
and you can measure the duration of the AR wave, 118, and you can compare it with the duration of the mitral A wave, which was 138 in this case. So in this case, you see that actually the duration of the mitral A wave was higher than the AR duration, which was suggesting, together with the S over D ratio above one, that the level of filling pressure was normal. In this patient at the moment of coronary angiography, the left ventricular pressure was measured and it came up normal LVEDP of nine. So just to summarize, we had out of the three parameter, one was positive, one was negative, the third one was not available, so it came up indeterminate by the algorithm. However, employing pulmonary vein flow was correct and helpful in estimating the level of uh, filling pressure, in this case, a normal LVEDP. So the way of employing this, of course, it's based mainly on measuring the duration of the A wave at the level of pulmonary vein flow. And you see here a case of a patient with normal pressure, again, S over the short A wave. And this is the case of a patient with a high left atrial pressure, S smaller than D, with a very minor small S wave, and the long duration of the AR wave. And the principle on which this is based is that when the left atrium contracts at the end of diastole, it can propel blood either forward in the ventricle or backwards into the pulmonary vein, and it will do so depending on the level of pressure in the ventricle. So the higher the pressure in the ventricle, the more prominent the AR wave at the pulmonary vein flow. This is the principle. So whenever you have an AR duration which is higher than the mitral A, this predicts uh, an increased LVEDP with a good accuracy. Importantly, this is a method that is independent of LV ejection fraction and it is also age independent. So the take home message from this first case is use supplementary methods in all patients who have an indeterminate filling pressure by the algorithm. And by supplementary methods, we mean pulmonary vein flow, as I've just shown you. Don't forget about the Valsalva maneuver, which may be very useful if it is properly performed and you are able to measure the mitral flow throughout the maneuver. And also left atrial strain, which is increasingly helpful Again, particularly in those cases where LV filling pressure comes indeterminate by the algorithm. Let me now show you a second case. This is a case of a 70-year-old uh, 70 woman complaining of dyspnea and fatigue with moderate exertion. She has severe hypertension, requiring four classes of drugs to control the blood pressure and also dyslipidemia. The ECG, I would say, is uh, unremarkable. It is normal sinus rate, no particular signs of left atrial dilatation or uh, even left ventricular hypertrophy. If you look at her echo, you can see the patient has left ventricular hypertrophy, the left atrium is dilated, LV ejection fraction is normal, and again, no wall motion abnormalities, no significant mitral regurgitation. If you then move to Doppler data, you see the mitral inflow looks like delayed relaxation with an E over A of 0.64. E prime is reduced below 7 at the septal level, 6.7 centimeters per second. So if you calculate the E over E prime using the septal side, it comes up at 11. And the peak velocity of the TR jet is normal, 2.4. So again, I'd like to ask you the same question. What is the filling pressure in this patient? One normal, two, increase, and three, cannot determine. Again, you have 30 seconds, and then we may discuss the results and the way we have proceeded in this particular case. Hmm. Now to the question, what is the filling pressure? 36% said normal, 48% said increased, and 17% answered cannot determine. Okay, here the answer is a bit more tricky. So of course, if you go by this, you can say that in the data that I've showed you, the left atrial pressure is normal, 
And uh, grade one diastolic dysfunction can be diagnosed because we are in this level. However, it also says that if the patient is symptomatic, we should consider coronary disease or proceed to a diastolic stress test. So again, remember the patient complained of significant symptoms during exercise, and I've already showed you the resting echo. So you need to keep this in mind, and whenever you have a discordance between the clinical presentation and the data you have, you can consider applying the exercise test. This is what we did. We exercised the patient on a supine bike, and actually she did so for seven minutes, Blood pressure increased significantly, 210 over 100 with peak exercise, and her symptoms were actually reproduced. She again complained of dyspnea and severe fatigue. If you then look at the Doppler data, the E wave increased significantly to 123, while the E prime stayed unmodified at 6.7, and therefore the ratio of E over E prime increased significantly up to 18. Also, there was an increase in TR jet velocity with a peak of 3.2 and, again, no new wall motion abnormalities and no increase in MR. So, if we recap, we started with a knee over E prime of 11, which was kind of in the uh, gray zone. This increased significantly to 18 during exercise and it remained increased even in the recovery period for a couple of minutes with an E over E prime uh, of still 15, uh, even when the heart rate slowed down. So the 2016 uh, guidelines uh, are the first version that actually make recommendations about the diastolic stress test. And it says that this is indicated whenever you have a patient with symptoms, with dyspnea, and in whom at rest uh, you diagnose grade one diastolic dysfunction. Of course, it can be performed either by supine bike or treadmill, and the test will be considered positive when all of the following conditions are met, that is E over E prime above the threshold, 14 or uh, for average uh, E prime or uh, 15 when using septal E prime, again, peak TR over 2.8 and septal E prime uh, below 7 in resting conditions. So the take-home message uh, from this case is please use exercise echo in patients who complain of symptoms during exercise, but in whom the resting echo shows delayed relaxation, but normal feeling pressure. So in this case, the use of exercise echo unmasked the level of feeling pressures that seemed to be normal in breath, but then it was clearly elevated during exercise and um, also her symptoms were uh, reproduced. So I'd like to make a short uh, conclusion uh, out of these uh, cases and uh, what I've showed you so far. Assessment of diastolic function should always be comprehensive and it should start always with clinical data. One cannot judge the level of uh, and uh, diastolic function just based on uh, echo parameters because you have to take the whole clinical context which makes a huge difference sometimes. So remember, look for risk factors for half path look at the main pathology, look at the associated conditions which may interfere with your assessment, and this applies to specific parameters. And then move with echo data, start with structural data by 2D echo, move to functional information by Doppler echo. There is no diastolic index able to work in isolation to make the diagnosis. So uh, uh, an integrated approach is recommended. You can start by measuring the four principal parameters that are recommended in all your patients, but don't forget to use any supplementary <coughs> methods that apply to your case whenever it is needed, depending on your patient. And again, do not forget to use stress diastology which is recommended in patients with exertional dyspnea who do not have evidence of increased feeling pressure in resting conditions. I would also like to finish off this presentation by inviting you, those who like diastology, to attend your ECHO uh, early December in Vienna, reminding you that on the first day of the Congress, December 4, 
we'll have a full course on diastolic function with many great speakers and quite a quite an attractive program. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Popescu, for this uh, first lecture. And uh, we'll come back to you with uh, some questions at the end or discussion. And now we're moving to our next speaker, Professor J. O. Please. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor uh, Smith. And uh, I'm very pleased to um, uh, be part of uh, this uh, webinar series. I'm J. O. from Mayo Clinic. And uh, um, I will try to share with you a couple of cases to highlight the uh, uh, strengths and also some limitations of the current uh, guidelines. And uh, uh, I'm pleased to see so many of you uh, join us and we'll uh, hope that uh, have a, a lot of uh, good discussion at the end of uh, our presentations. So um, um, uh, no disclosure uh, for these uh, presentations. And uh, this one, uh, uh, second algorithm from 2016, uh, been already shown by uh, Professor Popescu. Uh, and um, this was uh, 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 designed to be used for patients with the reduced ejection fraction, uh, meaning less than 50%, and or someone with a preserved EF, but uh, has a known or suspected diastolic dysfunction uh, as discussed. So clinically, hypertension, coronary disease, diabetes, uh, myocardial infarction, or history of heart failure, and 2D, uh, evidence of the uh, uh, LVH or LA enlargement. And we uh, ask uh, uh, you to proceed with the mitral info velocity first uh, uh, because of the assumption that uh, this patient population uh, have the uh, reduced E prime velocity, because we assume that uh, uh, in this clinical setting uh, that uh, patients do have uh, diastolic dysfunction. So uh, we assume that E prime velocity is already reduced. So uh, the, there's no true normal diastolic function in this particular clinical or 2D echocardiography findings. And I'll demonstrate to you, though, there's uh, some problems with uh, this uh, design. And uh, uh, as you can see, that we look at EOA ratio first, and if it's less than 0.8 uh, and the D velocity is less than 50 centimeters per second, that goes straight down to the grade one uh, diastolic dysfunction with the normal feeling pressure. And then uh, EOA ratio is a two or greater, then goes straight down to the grade three diastolic dysfunction. And then uh, you already heard from Professor Popescu about the uh, intermediate uh, the, uh, group of patients with the EOA ratio between 0.8 and then two, uh, 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 as you see uh, here. So let me just uh, uh, proceed with the uh, first case. Based on that, this is a 23-year-old male uh, with the left ventricular hypertrophy on electrocardiogram, and then you see the uh, personal uh, uh, long axis view uh, showing the uh, uh, thick septal, uh, uh, ventricular septum there with the normal ejection fraction and then E velocity is of 70 centimeters per second, and A velocity is of 30 centimeters per second, and E away ratio is 2.3. So I want you to vote whether this is a normal one, grade two, grade three, or it is indeterminate and using this uh, uh, algorithm. Okay. Otto? Well, uh, let's see now. Uh, I have to get through my my data screen to work. Uh, I didn't get the response in here. Uh, I don't know why. Maybe you should then just uh, comment on what sort of the... Uh, there's still remaining time. 21 seconds remaining. That's why I don't see it. Okay. So please consider it and uh, try to answer the question. All right. Just take a look at LVH. And here comes right. the answers. What does the arrow indicate? An A wave answered 16% of that one. J wave 14%. K wave zero. No, no, no. That's the uh, 
and uh, an O wave four and L wave sixty nine percent. L got sixty nine percent. It's a wrong question. Miss, uh, that's my second case. Uh, uh, okay, sorry, we went uh, well, wrong on this one. Uh, I think we just then you should uh, comment this one, uh, uh, Jay, and say what are the, the what is your uh, your answer to this one? Uh, it's supposed to uh, uh, supposed to um, uh, select one normal to grade two, grade three is uh, uh, number three, and four uh, is indeterminate. Okay, so. Uh, Based on the uh, this algorithm, uh, then uh, with a 2.3, uh, you see that with the uh, um, uh, the ratio of a 2.3 goes straight down to grade three diastolic dysfunction in 23 year olds. Okay, but let me show you uh, some problems with this approach because if you look at this uh, medially prime velocity of uh, this 23 year old, it's a centimeter per second, and e of a prime is nine. And the latter E prime is a 10 centimeter per second, and E of A prime is a seven. So killing pressure is a, a pretty normal based on the E of A prime. And also the uh, um, um, E prime velocity indicates that the relaxation is not uh, too bad, although it is lower than what we expected for 23 years old, but still is able to uh, fill the ventricle normally so that mitral inflow velocities actually uh, indicates normal filling uh, in this 23 year old. So I'm just gonna have you take a look at uh, this uh, uh, three individuals uh, with the personal long axis view showing on the left uh, with the complete normal relaxation with the E prime velocity 12. You can see that how the uh, uh, annulus moves backward very uh, uh, vigorously at the timing of the mitral opening early diastole. And if you go to the right side, this is a patient with the myopathy. The relaxation is really uh, is severely reduced so that the, it doesn't have a lot of relaxation pushing backward, the annulus velocity. And this case is a E prime is a four centimeter per second. And then the middle of it is a, a sort of average adult, a 65 to, uh, you know, the, the older than 65 years old, uh, maybe asymptomatic, but this is a seven centimeter per second sort of uh, uh, middle of uh, those two uh, individuals on the right and the left. But if you look at the uh, uh, our patient um, with a 23 year old, that annulus motion is more like the uh, 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 truly normal uh, E prime velocity because the E prime velocity was a uh, eight centimeter per second uh, there. So. That's where we have a little bit of problem of uh, incorporating uh, the uh, clinical data to the uh, to uh, uh, to a uh, second algorithm uh, that uh, 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 we we just used. So uh, we have more data for this 23 year old. How can you prove this patient has a actually normal feeling pressure? LA volume index is 29, and TR velocity is two meter per second, and RVRT is a 120 millisecond. All of that indicates the uh, normal feeling pressure. And then uh, we also did the uh, Balsado maneuver just to prove the point that you can see uh, the E velocity and A velocity, both of them uh, decrease uh, concordantly, uh, which is the case for normal, truly normal diastolic filling. And then E away ratio <clears throat> did not change at all. Uh, uh, so from 2.3 to uh, remain as 2.0. This is a patient or individual with a truly normal diastolic filling and normal diastolic function. But that particular algorithm forces us to grade this uh, 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 individual as a grade three uh, diastolic uh, dysfunction. So that's the, uh, 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 this is an example of the uh, abnormal Valsada maneuver that the E velocity goes down, uh, but the A velocity goes up, uh, indicating uh, the significant a change in the E over A ratio uh, from the 2.3 to 1.0. Uh, this is an example of the uh, grade two uh, diastolic uh, dysfunction. So point of uh, uh, this case uh, is that individuals with hypertension, coronary disease, LVH, diabetes mellitus, or myocardial infarction can have normal diastolic function. You know, that's a problem, especially in young individuals. And the current guideline, uh, uh, you know, kind of a force us to make diastolic dysfunction in all of them, all individuals with any of those clinical 
uh, uh, history or uh, or uh, echo uh, uh, findings, but we got to be very careful with the younger individuals because uh, they still can have relatively normal diastolic function even with that clinical uh, information. It's a slightly different from the uh, Dr. Popescu's patient uh, uh, that uh, you already uh, seen. So this is another example of that. Patient with the anterior infarction, both of them has uh, 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 apical one motion uh, changes there. As you see, EF over 40% at the top, uh, EF over 45% at the bottom. Um, and for us, uh, uh, you know, for for us to use the second algorithm, you can look at the much info velocity. Uh, both, they are almost identical in both of them. Okay, so it's not less than 0.8. It's not greater than uh, two, so probably grade two diastolic dysfunction. But if you look at the uh, uh, other data, uh, upper patient has an EPROM velocity of six centimeters per second with the EVO EPROM is 18. So exactly right, this is a, a, a grade two diastolic dysfunction according to the guideline. But at the bottom panel, uh, EPROM is eight. This is a normal diastolic relaxation with a normal EVO prime and then TR velocity is a two meters <clears> per second. And we have to call this patient as a normal diastolic function, uh, almost same as the uh, 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 first case that Dr. Professor Popescu showed, the 49-year-old patient, the similar finding, it should have been a normal diastolic function only because of the clinical history went to the indeterminate, and then we end up doing other, uh, other uh, 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 diastolic uh, parameters to uh, assess. So, I just want to make sure that uh, we understand this particular algorithms again, be careful that uh, the reason we put this one uh, uh, to use the EOA ratio first is that we assume that EOA uh, E prime velocity is reduced in all of those patients with uh, reduced EF or uh, 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 the known or suspected diastolic dysfunction. But Many times uh, in our laboratory, sometimes echocardiography is, a, is the first exam, we may not have a clinical history, or this clinical history may not be reliable uh, that to be used for this parameter. So I just uh, uh, ask you, recommend that whenever you have the EOA ratio two or greater with a, this history, just check quickly whether E prime velocity is less than seven, and then you can go down to the uh, grade three diastolic dysfunction. But, you, but if E prime velocity is eight centimeter or greater in from medial uh, uh, annulus, then you have to think that this may be a, a, can be a normal diastolic function or normal feeling pressure in some patients there. So let me just uh, move on to the second case. Uh, let me just have uh, uh, you vote on this. This much info velocity and the arrow indicates the velocity uh, in the mid diastole. Is it a A wave? Uh, J wave, K wave, O wave, or L wave. Okay, you have a thirty seconds. I think the previous uh, 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 choices uh, were this <coughs> question. Okay. Yeah, now we got it right here. Uh, what does the arrow indicate? 10% says A wave, 12% J wave, 2% K wave, 1% O wave, and 78% says L wave. 78%? 78, 78, majority. Wow. There's a fantastic audience there. I, I don't really have to talk about this a little more, but I think you're exactly right. Uh, I, and this is a, a L wave, a mid diastolic flow uh, velocity, which is very important that we, we, we use. Uh, because the, uh, this is a usually a, a pathologic L wave is usually greater than 40 centimeters per second related to the uh, delayed relaxation of the heart and usually indicates grade 2 or grade 3 dysfunction with an increased feeling pressure with, uh, with the delayed relaxation. And this was actually uh, 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 you know, published in normal heart first, uh, in healthy normal heart also can have L wave, as you can see on the right side, but usually it's less than 40 centimeters per second, and because of the uh, uh, bradycardia and the little reflective wave in the, uh, uh, in the, in the uh, left ventricular filling, 
So uh, if you look at the L wave here in pathologically, uh, you can also see in the tissue Doppler. And this is related to the delayed relaxation. So after the early filling here, uh, which is elevated because of the relaxation uh, continuing, you have the uh, uh, drop of the LV dioxide pressure allowing uh, another flow from the pulmonary vein to the uh, left atrium to the ventricle uh, you see uh, here with the L wave. And this is also helpful in patients with atrial fibrillation. And you can see the L wave at AFib, and it's a, a most likely uh, marked delayed relaxation with the uh, uh, increase of uh, feeling pressure uh, in this patient. So this is a really beautiful uh, 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 image of the L wave. Uh, uh, color M mode, you're showing the middle uh, mid eye flow there. And then this is the L wave of the uh, mitral inflow. And this is a pulmonary vein uh, L wave. The reason for L wave was they, they used to call pulmonary vein systolic velocity is J and diastolic velocity is a K. And then the, the letter after that is L. So they come up with L wave uh, in that. So whenever you see L wave more than 40 centimeters per second, and most likely it will be a grade two or grade three diastolic dysfunction. And uh, so this is a patient that uh, uh, L wave with a TR velocity. For all four parameters are abnormal. So this is grade three diastolic dysfunction. In this case, uh, uh, we uh, we uh, 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 could use that particular uh, guidelines. So with that limitation, we uh, revised at the Mayo Clinic. At least we uh, decided to revise the uh, uh, proposed algorithm and uh, decide to combine those two first and second algorithm for most patients. And I just have to, uh, to tell you that this. Uh, Proposed algorithm was accepted for uh, for publication. Uh, you'll see that in a couple of months. But in most patients, meaning uh, you know, except for the patients with the annular calcification, mitral regurg, uh, conduction delay, hypertrope, or constriction, uh, in most of the patients clinically, we ask you to use only the septal E prime velocity, uh, UV prime of uh, 15 or less, TR velocity of 2.8 or less. Uh, LA volume index of 40, 34 ml per meter square as a normal values. And then these are the same uh, parameters that the uh, 2016 guideline tells us. And then when three or four are normal, we want you to uh, 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 estimate feeling pressure first. It's a little bit of reverse of what the current guideline says. Current guideline asks us to do grading first <coughs> and then to the uh, uh, feeling pressure. But I, we, we found some problems with that approach that we uh, want you to uh, estimate <coughs> first when there are three or four normal, those are normal feeling pressure. And then based on E of A ratio, you can uh, either say truly normal diastolic function or grade one. And uh, I think that uh, 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 if we use that, I think for Pesco's case, case one would be the normal diastolic function Second case would have been a grade one diastolic dysfunction here. And then if a three or four abnormal, then we say increased feeling pressure. The reason for that is three or four parameters we use, the U weight prime of 15, TR velocity of 2.8, LA volume index of 34, all indicates not only the diastolic dysfunction, but also increased feeling pressure. So you have a three of them are there present, they all have increased feeling pressure. You don't have to back and forth in the first and second algorithm. And then after that, based mm -hmm. on the UV ratio, less than two will be grade two, and then uh, more than two will be grade three diastolic dysfunction. Maybe uh, uh, more practical in our clinical practice. It has to be validated and then see how uh, uh, you know that helps you with the uh, uh, clinical uh, practice. So I just want to finish up with the uh, 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 my. Uh, 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 comment on the strain imaging. I think that whenever we see the grade three with the thick walls, we want to make sure that we don't have any cardiac amyloid, and then we do the uh, strain imaging typical for the cardiac amyloidosis. And also the uh, LA strain uh, may be helpful because it may be more helpful than LA volume index because LA volume index has a lot of overlap between normal and abnormal diastolic function. And it is actually enlarged in 26% of the normal uh, population in European study. And also the LA volume index may not regress 
uh, after the healing pressure gets normalized, but uh, it was shown that LA strain uh, 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 actually goes better with the LA uh, feeling pressure, LB feeling pressures. And also the uh, University of Chicago, uh, Dr. Loboto Lang's uh, lab shown that the LA strain value uh, gradually decreases with the uh, uh, worsening of diastolic dysfunction. So I think we need a more uh, uh, clinical validation and more experience to uh, use LA strain, but it appears to be quite uh, promising mm -hmm. uh, for future uh, uh, assessment of the diastolic function. So I just want to mention about the uh, mitral annulus E prime velocity. Uh, the ASCE CVI recommends average value, lateral, medial, but we feel that the uh, E prime velocity from one location is still acceptable in most of situation, except for uh, uh, in the setting of uh, pulmonary hypertension, conduction delay, low motion change, mitral annulus calcification, or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Mm. Uh, as you see here, an example of uh, someone with uh, significant mitral annulus calcification, and EOV ratio appears to be grade one. But the lateral E prime and the medial E prime is markedly reduced, not because of just a myocardial disease, but because of the annulus calcification. Also, this patient has a, a TAVR at the aortic valve position here. And pulmonary vein shows normal filling pressure, and TR velocity shows 2.4 meter per second. So I think that we need to be very careful uh, for using EOV prime for several uh, clinical conditions, uh, most commonly the patients with the mitral annulus annulus calcification, as you see uh, here. So this is a data from uh, Bizagui's lab in Houston, showing that the uh, best uh, correlation in the uh, annulus cal calcification patient is the E over E ratio or RVRT, not E over E prime ratio. And this is the algorithm they put together. We look at the E over E ratio first, and then uh, uh, based on E over uh, E ratio, we say normal feeling pressure or high feeling pressure. And if you have a, uh, in between, then you use the RDRT. So uh, uh, I just show this one. I, I think we uh, 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 demonstrate to you that echocardiography is very, uh, very valuable. And I think this, uh, this was written a few years ago, but I really feel that uh, echocardiography can do most of a hemodynamic assessment uh, in, our, uh, in our patients, you know, RA pressure, uh, uh, the pulmon uh, RB pressures, pulmonic pressures. Now I tell, we are telling you that the even wedge pressure or fitting pressure can be done by the uh, diastolic function assessment that we just show by the uh, a few cases. So learning points is that I think that if you have a patient with a confirmed diastolic dysfunction, you know, history of a heart failure or reduced E prime velocity, you can or we can start with the EOA ratio as in the 2016. However, just be mindful that the clinical and or 2D echo images may not be reliable in some situations, especially younger patients, or, or not available. And uh, there's a, some problem sometimes with the adjud adjudication of uh, diastolic dysfunction based on clinical history. The, I think if you get the E prime velocity, just make sure they have a diastolic dysfunction, then I don't think we have any problems there. And I think that the uh, diastolic dysfunction, in my opinion, uh, relaxation is reduced, then that's a diastolic dysfunction. So that whenever you see the uh, uh, reduced E prime velocity, we should call that as a, a diastolic dysfunction. And then we may be able to combine two algorithms, two unified algorithms. Uh, hopefully uh, you can try that in your practice and just give us a feedback as to whether that's a uh, better or uh, we need a more uh, improvement to make uh, in our uh, assessment is very important uh, a parameter uh, in our uh, patients in our laboratory. Thank you uh, uh, so much for your uh, for listening. Well, thank you so much to both speakers. Uh, and we, I think we had some great lectures and uh, uh, we have seen that it's feasible to measure that how we function easily by a but there are some challenges. And some of the questions are, uh, I think we don't have time to take all, but we have um, have uh, some uh, things which I think we should address. And that one is about, what about in atrial fibrillation? First, is it, can we do grading of uh, diastolic dysfunction in atrial fibrillation? And can we assess filling pressure? Maybe one of you would like to comment that? Yeah, I can, I can, I can briefly comment on that. 
So yeah, that is a particular problem. I will just say that uh, I enjoyed the Professor O's lecture. I think we should always apply the critical reasoning, and of course, whatever you see in these algorithms applies to most patients, but not all. So you need to apply the specific uh, evaluation that is relevant to that case. For example, in uh, atrial fibrillation, of course, it, uh, left atrial volume is not reliable as a measure of diastolic dysfunction because it's increased due to atrial fibrillation per se. Uh, also, you don't have um, Doppler parameters A wave or AR wave because it does not exist in atrial fibrillation, no atrial pump. So then this is a bit more uh, difficult than in other situations. However, we can apply similar sort of reasoning. For example, E prime is still very important, and Professor O has mentioned this is crucial because a reduced E prime is a measure of impaired myocardial relaxation. And then, yeah, we do not grade the sort of dysfunction in atrial fibrillation. And as a parenthesis, I think the uh, emphasis should not be put, in my opinion, on different degrees. But from a clinical standpoint, it's important to differentiate increased pressures from normal pressures. Yeah. That is the main question. Then whether it is type two, uh, grade 2 or grade 3 is less important. So to come back, a said E prime is important. And then to look for uh, filling pressure, we should always look at the IVRT. A short IVRT may suggest filling, uh, high filling pressure. You can again look at E over E prime, which is available. The higher it is, the higher likelihood the pressures are high. And some technical problems, you need to average several cycles, and that may be tricky, or to select a representative cycle to do your measurement in case uh, the heart rate of variability is very high. And another thing that is specific to atrial fibrillation, always look at the mitral inflow with a slow speed and look whether the uh, E wave has a lot of variability because it has been shown that whenever filling pressure is increased, there is less beat-to-beat uh, -beat variation uh, in this context. The other thing I wanted to mention, if possible, is about E prime, because I agree with Professor O, this is crucial that we start with. I would say, and we have discussed this in the task force when putting together this document, that I, I think one of the, one other limitation is that uh, we try to apply single cutoff values, so trying to force into a dichotomized uh, yes or no sort of uh, thinking, when this is not always easy. For example, if you take E prime, of course, eight will not make the threshold, but eight may be decreased in a young patient. It may be normal in an old patient. So I think this is also something to look at when you make your assessment. If you just take a single value, especially with the measure that varies with age and with other parameters, then uh, you may get to the wrong conclusion. Okay, uh, I think uh, I have another very good question, which is can which I, parent... Can I just Sorry? make one comment there? Yeah? I, I think, you know, very, very good uh, discussion. I think that the, uh, you know, if you uh, actually go back to the, uh, you know, the proposed, uh, really revised proposal there, you can use uh, exactly the same thing for atrial fibrillation, uh, except for the U-boy prime of 11 as a cutoff rather than 15 uh, from the medial. I mean, the, the U-boy prime of atrial uh, fibrillation has been always been done from medial E prime velocity, and that's what we recommend. And I think that uh, the slight difference from uh, Professor Popescu's point of view and also the guideline committee uh, is that whether it's really healthy or uh, good to use a different cutoff uh, of a E prime velocity based on age. Uh, that's where we have a, a big problems coming that uh, many of the patients with the grade one uh, be normal uh, as a rate as normal uh, because we are sort of thinking there's uh, it's an age-related diastolic, diastolic uh, relaxation problem, we should call that as normal, but I think they do also still have the uh, higher chance of developing atrial fibrillation and problem. So I think the, uh, uh, 
it's a little tricky there, but I, uh, it, it, while we're trying to honor the age-related uh, diastolic problem uh, as a relatively normal, then that causes a problem for the pediatric or younger patients uh, because, uh, you know, uh, eight centimeters per second or seven centimeters per second may be uh, age-related at 65, but that's abnormal for 54-year-old or 20-year-old and we end up calling them as a normal diastolic function. So we have to be a little bit careful of that. Okay, I think we, we have a few more questions. I maybe try to answer a little uh, brief if possible. A good one here is um, uh, when you have a, a, a look for the filling pressure and the conclusion is indeterminate, non-conclusive based on the guidelines, what is the sequence of other parameters you should look at? Which ones? See, I, I like yeah. I like the pulmonary vein. Uh, yeah, so that's one important one. If you have a good signal, what's the right. next one? If you don't have a pulmonary vein signal, and then I think it'll be good to do the uh, uh, IVIT or uh, or uh, uh, side of maneuver. Yeah, IVIT less than sixty-five. Is that sort of the cutoff approximately for high filling pressure? Yes. Roughly, yeah. IVIT. What, what about strain? LA strain. Well, let's say it's strain. We have not done too much of the uh, too much of the uh, uh, LA strain, so <laughs> I cannot tell you. And then if we try a little bit of research, why there's still a lot of overlap, so I don't have any. Uh, I, yeah. Don't, yeah. I agree. I think this is very attractive from a theoretical standpoint, and there are some preliminary studies showing it works. But still, we have a bit more work to do when it comes to the practical use. I mean. Exactly how you standardize, what you use, what cutoff you use. Because if you want this to be used uh, in daily practice in a normal lab, then you need to come up with something which is really tested and validated. So I okay. think that's important, but probably Palmer is yeah. already there. Valzalva will also support. Yeah. Yeah. What about the LV global oxygen strain? If LV GLS is down, does it support high feeding pressure? If it's if it's not conclusive by the guidelines, but it, it's a maybe I don't think you can say high feeling pressure. You probably say diastolic dysfunction. Heart uh, disease, probably. Yeah, you got yeah. exactly. I think. Uh, you move on. What about children? Can we apply guideline these guidelines we have been through to children? And that's where we like the uh, uh, revised pro uh, revised uh, 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 guideline algorithm because if you uh, use the seven centimeter per second. And uh, we may underestimate or uh, undercall a lot of diastolic dysfunction in the children because children should have a E prime velocity of uh, 15, you know, and then uh, even 10 may not be normal for them. So we really need to establish the uh, normal yeah. uh, diastolic function parameters for the. Yeah, should be done. Yeah. What about pacemakers? Patient with pacemakers, RV pacing. How can you assess filling pressure in the left ventricle? If you pacing or left bundle branch block, if you look at them, most of the times, E prime velocity of the lateral is almost three times higher than the medial. You may end up getting yeah. E prime velocity from the medial of a four or three, and the lateral maybe nine or ten. So it's a very hard to uh, to uh, to 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 uh, do that. I would use the same as a virtual annulus calcification. I would use a U by ratio first. In RBRT and pulmonary vein for the conduction delay, not yeah. the U by ratio, U by prime. Ratio. I think that the discussion about the size of E prime is also important. And you've mentioned you can stick with one, but again, probably useful to highlight that in some specific scenarios, we need to be careful, like wall motion abnormalities, <coughs> of course, space uh, constriction. There we need to again apply resonating and Try to see what works. Maybe on average, or maybe you go for the lateral. You compare the both. That's so, important from a practical standpoint. So what yeah. I tell my sonographer and fellows and other physicians about the uh, uh, the you know the e prime velocity from both sides. I think we do both all of them because it's very important for diagnosing constrictions and all of that. But for feeling pressure wise, if it's uh, within uh, differences within uh, uh, you know thirty or forty percent range, you know is a uh, 10 and 12 or or uh, 6 and 8 or those are fine but if it's more than double then you have a problem uh, you know yeah. there's uh, some problems still then yeah. I don't use the one yeah. E prime velocity alone you got to average or do other things with that a quick one should be for guys all these stress tests use the, uh, the bicycle or the treadmill or both 
I forget. So the Mayo Clinic, we just we just presented it to sixteen thousand uh, patients with the dice-like uh, exercise test uh, at the uh, ASC, uh, and the Dr. Kane and then fellow uh, Dr. Luong did that. We uh, most of times we do a treadmill test because uh, patients comes in for ischemia too, and then we do treadmill first, uh, and then ischemia uh, evaluation for the wall motion, which will take about a minute, and then uh, let the uh, EO body ratio on fuse, and we get TR velocity, and then the mitral annulus, and then uh, mitral infobolus that way. So we yeah. do most times with treatment. Yeah, uh, I'm a one. Like do do yeah, please. No, uh, just, yeah, I guess in, in Europe, it's more use of a uh, supine bike, which has advantage that you can follow throughout the test. But indeed, I agree with the point of uh, Jay that you can do that. Yeah. And it's important uh, that you, you look when they are unfused, the ENA wave, I show the example. Another quick one, has lung ultrasound, the, the pulmonary lung ultrasound, a real place in assessing fluid pressure? I think we should do more and more of that. We have the, uh, we already shown the data at the ASC too. I think that the patients, uh, 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 you know, it's a, uh, lung ultrasound is very uh, sensitive uh, picking up for the pulmonary venous congestion. So the, during recovery, uh, I think it's a good idea uh, to do the lung ultrasound to make sure to look at the B lines, but so I think specific the, uh, trading, but, is, it, is it difficult or can you just go ahead? But UV primal fifteen is uh, specific, but it's not really sensitive. So uh, yeah. I think that right. uh, we should uh, combine the lung yeah. ultrasound. Yeah. Now, what about that of your stress test? One more question here. Uh, when you when you have reached a peak exercise and you me measure the post re uh, post exercise recovery period. Is TR velocity or is the mitral EOA prime the most useful measure to focus on? It's short time, one to two or three minutes, you know, when you do the abdominal uh, exercise. Well, yeah, I guess it's difficult to categorize, I mean, which is more important. Uh, we look for both. Uh, both, yeah. Couldn't say, yeah. But, but couldn't I, say which is Better. Yeah, I think that, you know, you know, I think UV prime, if it's more than 15, is a pretty specific, you know, by itself. Yeah. But I think it's a, a less than 15, then I think it will be more specific combined with the TR velocity there. So it really depends on yeah. how depends. many yeah. times. One more here. Can we have heart failure with normal feeling pressure? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think sure, so. yeah. I mean, heart failure with normal feeling pressure at rest, right? But with the exercise yeah. of stress, uh, but I think patients, that think, you know, well compensated patients with the uh, high exactly. failure with feeling pressures. So with exercise, you should always maybe have high feeling pressure with heart failure. How is that? No, I think so. If well compensated, you know, that's our goal to make sure that patients' uh, feeling pressure doesn't go up even with exercise. So I think that uh, uh, patients can have normal feeling pressure with exercise if it's well treated. In my opinion, I said heart failure. Okay. Um, now we uh, have uh, one here about in LV hypertrophy. Can you use the mitral ENA as uh, you do otherwise if you have a very, very hypertrophic ventricle? I would make a comment here. I think that despite the fact, so if you have significant LVH, then your relaxation may be so affected that the E over A stays below one despite high ceiling pressures. So okay. here, you should be careful, and here you may use Valsalva and uh, look at the response of the A-wave, because these patients, although usually they have normal LA pressure, they may still have increased pressure that is not uh, found out by the uh, uh, mitral infill pattern. Yeah. The final one about uh, to, to Professor O, can you show the revised guidelines, propose the gain, and then the message is that this uh, webinar is available on the EACVI website. Furthermore, for that specific uh, proposed algorithm, it's coming up in JEC Imaging. So um, I would like to thank the speakers for the great talks and for to the audience for attending. So thank you very much. Thank you.